how did you get the name Ace? Uh, well, once I've become a gladiator, they were like, well, you've got to start thinking about uh, uh, choosing a gladiator name. It's a very difficult thing to do because you know that you're going to be called this name for the rest of your life, potentially. You know, it's going to stick with you. And I noticed all the gladiators called each other by their gladiator name, which is a bit weird. You know, hello, Cobra. Hello, Lightning. It was all just a bit, a bit odd. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, I want something that's just not too cheesy, you know. And they were like, they suggested Ace, the producers, uh, Nigel Lifto. He sedu uh, seduced. <laughs> he suggested. No, it's none of that. No, no, he, he, um, he suggested um, Ace from the beginning. And when I watched the show, I, I watched it, and Ulrika would say, like, next up we've got Matt, and Matt will be uh, facing the mighty Rhino or, or the mighty uh, uh, Warrior. And I thought, next up we've got Matt, and he'll be facing Ace. Just sounded <laughs> rubbish. And so I was very anti-ace, actually. And, and interestingly enough, the other gladiators warned me. They said, when you become famous, show business is a business. The clue's in the name. I always wanted to be rich and famous, and I just thought, once you became that, that's it. You live happily ever after. But they said, no, there's a commercial agenda. You're not a very important person. You're a CIP, not a VIP. You're a commercially important person. So choose a name that businesses can work through. And he said, and don't sell out. Don't sell out. And I was like... And, and he... He was a gladiator, and actually he'd gone from being a TV gladiator, this guy that was giving me this advice, and he was now in Hollywood, and he had the part of Action Man. And, uh, and I was like, well, you have a great gladiator name. What are you worried about? And he said, um, and his, name, his gladiator name was Trojan. And he said, well, yeah, Trojan, it's a, it's a mighty gladiator, gladiator name in this country. He said, but in America, a Trojan is a condom. And so I understood what he was saying. You've got to think about what your name's going to be. And so it was be. a commercial thing on Ace? Like what was... Yeah, so uh, McVitie's had bought out... Um, I didn't know this, but McVitie's had bought out... Uh, 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 or were about to bring out a biscuit. And, uh, uh, and the producer said to me, OK, have you thought any more about Ace? I said, I really, really don't like it. Anything but Ace. And they said, well... If you choose Ace, it comes with um, twenty thousand pounds worth of advertising revenue as a starter. I said, I love the name, <laughs> <laughs> but I did sell out commercially, and I did regret it because when the biscuit came out, uh, the advert came on between the Gladiator shows, and it was a little cartoon character biscuit in a wrapper. And I remember my mum and dad saying, "Is that you then? Is that supposed to be you?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm the Ace." And uh, I'll never forget this biscuit went up in a lift. It put a bungee cord around the bottom of its wrapper. It jumped off the building. When it got to the bottom, the, the bungee cord pulled. The, the biscuit came out of its wrapper, smashed all over the pavement, and then it said, uh, Ace, the incredibly thick chocolate biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been getting that ever since. So you can imagine, thick. I'm from Essex. I couldn't even say the word thick. So I'm like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the thick biscuit. So, uh, yeah, I did live to regret that name. As luck would have it, though, the biscuit didn't continue. It, no one liked the thick biscuit. Um, you got, you know, you got the celebrity life eventually. But, um, tell us about life growing up. When did you first want to become a celebrity, and why? Uh, well, my dad was a roof tiler, and uh, we lived on a we lived on a council estate. And my dad was a very honest, hardworking man, and he had some great sayings. And he said, "Skills pay the bills." So uh, he said, uh, uh, "Dirty hands is clean money." So he said, "You know, work hard, play hard, and that's what life's about." And these things. Um, but roofing is the third most dangerous job in the, in, in the world, apparently, is what, you know, to do. And I was a skinny kid, so dad would try and take me to work. I had four brothers, and I hated it. And actually, I could see there was no happiness in it, really, because if it rained, he was self-employed, we had no money. Um, he always come back filthy dirty, and I just was like, and I, wasn't, I just was like, dad, I don't want to do this job. It's, it's a horrible job. And um, I think what didn't help there, Matt, was uh, one of my brothers died. And when one of my brothers died, mum and dad said to me, um, there is no God. If there was a God, your, uh, your brother wouldn't have died. And that made um, uh, perfect sense to me. So I was very, I got a little bit philosophical really as a kid. I thought, okay, so if there's no God and you get one life, nobody lasts, lasts forever. We're all going to die. Sorry, I know it's a bit depressing on a Friday night. But, you know, we were all moving up the queue. I'm further up the queue than you. And I just thought to myself, well, I want to live rich and I want to be wealthy and I want fame. And when I was growing up, it was a celebrity culture very similar to now. You know, you've got The Rock now on TV and stuff, but when I was growing up, it was um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was the highest paid movie star in history. And so I looked at him and thought, okay, so he goes to the gym and he lifts weights. Um, but I don't really, he's been to acting school, you know. <laughs> I thought, actually, I reckon I could do what he's doing. So I said to Dad, look, Dad, I want to be a movie star. 
and I don't want to do roofing. And he was like, growing up, I was a bit like, my dad don't like me because he was quite hard on me. But actually, it was fear. He was worried. He thought I was deluded. He thought that life was something for somebody else. And so he really tried to talk me out of that from a young age. But I really set my sights on being rich and famous and being a movie star and getting on the big screen. And um, yeah, what did it... What do you think it was going to take? Like, what did you put yourself through to? I thought it'd take, that? you know, if you buy all the magazines, muscle and fitness and stuff, it says if you drink this protein powder and take these tablets, you too can look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I thought, well, okay, if I take all these um, powders and things, I'll look like him. So I'll train, I started to train. I was training for a few years. But the reality is, I couldn't get to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I couldn't work out why. But again, we're going back to this commercial agenda. There's no real sport of bodybuilding. You can't really look superhuman like that without anabolic steroids. But unfortunately, you know, you get to a point where there's no return. I invested all this time, all my dreams were in that. Um, and, so, and so I sort of, um, there was a time where I had to consider taking anabolic steroids. And, and I think what's unfortunate about that is dad gave me an, an ultimatum in the end. He said, he said uh, if you don't have a job by the time you leave school, I'm going to kick you out. And it was his tough discipline. It was his tough love. If I kick him out, he'll come back and then maybe he'll, you know, get some skills, come and be a roofer with me and these things. Uh, and he was, he was true to his word. And I think what else didn't help uh, was, uh, I, had a, I didn't know this then, but I have attention deficit disorder, which is a mental disability, which essentially means, whereas other kids were looking at the blackboard and learning, I was sort of staring out the window and counting roof tiles and stuff. Um, so academics weren't going to be something where I could, you know, I could go forward. And so dad worried about that. And uh, true to his word, at 16, the tough love came and he kicked me out. All my brothers, incidentally, became roofers and builders, just as he wanted, free labourers. And, um, you know, just at that moment at 16, what, what do you think of Jesus? Like, was that a, you know, a bloke in you know, some concept of? What, uh, well, what again, you like thought? I say, if, you know, I, your, your mum and dad are a big influence on you. And if your mum and dad say to you, there is no God, and you, they, sh- they can prove that because your little brother died, it's like, yeah, well... Um, and so I'd been to churches, and, and, uh, and I was thoroughly bored in them, stand up, sit down, listen to some weird hymn, some weirdo, shake your hand, bloke at the front, dressed as your mum, telling you he's your dad, all of these things. <laughs> I was like this, uh, and so I'd just be like, what's going on in here then? And, uh, and I just found all of this uh, confusing. And mum and dad, you know, if someone knocked at the door, if it was Jehovah's Witness or something, they'd be like, all right. It's Bible bashers. They're going to brainwash us and these things. So, um, so I was really not for that. And actually, if you look to culture and who culture say that Jesus is, um, I didn't want to be no part of that. You know, I wanted, I wanted to be self-sufficient. I want to be a macho man. You know, my religion was, was following Schwarzenegger. He was my idol. And my, you know, I was, I was putting my faith in myself. So, um, so Jesus in culture, you know, floats around in a dressing gown, a pair of flip-flops crying whenever he sees something evil. I was like, no, thank you. That's not for me. And, and so you applied, to get on Gladiator. you applied to get on Gladiators, and you, um, like, tell us about that. Like, how do you actually get on Gladiators? Uh, well, so it was the first reality TV show in that any member of the public can write in and pit their wits against the mighty Gladiators. So, um, so that's what I did. I just wrote in, back when there was letters, without emails, you know, wrote a letter, put a stamp on it, posted it to London. Uh, and just said, I, want to, I don't want to be a contestant, I want to be a gladiator. And uh, I didn't think I'd hear much back, but they invited me to a tryout where I went against 60 other guys that were roided up like me. <laughs> and we was all given a big stick, like a big cotton bud, and we all had to fight each other. And, uh, and it was a bit scary, but I noticed quite quickly that, you know, with all this aggression and testosterone, everyone wants this top job, you know, on gladiators, they pay £2,000 an hour. So it was like, we all want this job. And uh, I just thought, well... These people are going to beat me, but if it's a Saturday night TV family show, surely they're going to want to see controlled aggression. So I had a little bit of a plan going in, and then I just thought, as I'm fighting, I'll smile. <laughs> so I did. So I'd, I'd hit someone, and I'd smile, and they'd hit me, and I'd smile. <laughs> and uh, even though it was hurting, I'd say, yeah, this is great. <laughs> and, uh, and then John Anderson, who was a referee of the show, come over at the end, and this was weird, actually. I just remember this. He came up to me, and he said, in front of all these big bodybuilders, all sort of sweating and... And he said, um, you've got the job, but don't tell anyone. And then he walked out of the room. And they were all like, what did he say? And I was like, um. Because, because they have to leak it to the press and these sorts of things. So you're not allowed. So I was sworn to secrecy. So it was a bit tricky. But it was like winning the lottery. You know, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? I've got the job. I'm the next gladiator. You know. And straight out to gladiator, tra- gladiator training camp from there. What was it like to actually be a gladiator? Well, when my dad kicked me out, if he was homeless in Harlow at that time, 
the place you went is to a hostel, and the nearest hostel was the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. And I didn't choose the Women's Christian Association. There just wasn't a YMCA. So I moved into this. I was homeless, essentially. Um, so I went from having nothing. It was a recession. I had no job. I felt like a loser because I was now taking steroids. I was thinking, I ain't got any skills to pay the bills. You know, maybe Dad was right. And then all of a sudden, overnight, you now find yourself catapulted into fame, you know. And so they sent a big stretch Mercedes to the YWCA in Harlow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember little Lena who worked on the desk looking around the corner. She went, oh, that's a posh car, isn't it? And I was like, yep, and I'm getting in it. And it took me to uh, Heathrow Airport where I met all the other gladiators, Wolf and Jet and Lightning. And, uh, and then they flew me off to Mauritius first class to the gladiator training camp, uh, which wasn't really a training camp, Matt, Matt, uh, Matt actually. It was... Um, it was just like a month-long party. It was incredible. <laughs> but you were under some kind of pressure to perform. Just tell us about that. Um, yes. Yeah, so on the show, uh, I mean, it was good in that you filmed the... It looked like a live event, but actually you filmed the whole show in one month in Birmingham at the National Indoor Arena. Um, so essentially, you just worked one month a year, which was lovely. But So you had the rest of the year off, but in that year, uh, sorry, in that month, there was a lot of pressure because a bit like a footballer not scoring goals, if you didn't win 70% of the games as a gladiator, they paid you to beat somebody, um, you, you were looking at the sack and, and your contract was only renewed on a yearly basis. There was lots of gladiators that went before me that got the sack for not performing. So it was stressful. There was a lot of injuries. People were breaking necks and backs and these things. But it was also a lot of fun as well. And just going from you know the YWCA to £2,000 an hour, like what does that... What does that do to what did that do to you? Like, well, it's a big relief to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think firstly it was it was I immediately started to become conceited. You know, if you if you've completely bought into a celebrity culture, and then you've made it and you've cracked it, and you're now a celebrity. You know, you've, I was worshiping myself. I was wearing it, work, idolizing Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now all of a sudden, people were idolizing me. I was going out in the streets. People were going, "Hey, can I have your autograph?" And so. Straight away, I started to change, and I could sense it. I was becoming con conceited, and I was like, well, if there is a God, surely he must love me, because I've got the best job in the world. I've got all this money coming in. I'm flying around the world first class. I've got all these girls chasing me now. that They weren't interested before. This is phenomenal. It's like, so um, initially, it was, it was lovely to have all this money. I used to go to the cash point, and it was always overdrawn. And it's funny. When you're skinned and you're overdrawn, the bank charge you. And they say, right, you're skinned, so we're going to charge you another tenner for being overdrawn. I used to think that's strange, but then when you suddenly got loads of money in the bank, the banks are tripping over themselves to give you more. So I had all this money and I didn't know what to spend it on, but because I had no financial acumen, it literally just went through my hands. I just was buying everything I wanted, and as a, a, an Essex lad, first thing I bought was a massive telly, like this thing, <laughs> and, uh, and then a big leather sofa, and then I went and bought a new BMW convertible. My dad was like, I've got to hand it to your son. I was wrong. You're right. You can uh, more in an hour than I can make in a week, and on a best, you know, a best, and I was very much, there was no humility there by this point, you know, I was like, yeah, I know, Dad, told you I was going to be famous, and I am, you know, and he was, when he was at work, he was giving people signed autographs for me, and it was getting him work, and these sorts of things, so initially, um, it was great. I sense that didn't continue, though, what was some of the kind of signs it wasn't all it was cracked up to be? Well, like I said earlier, show business is a business, I had no idea, you know, so there's a, there's a commercial agenda there, so... You present the, uh, the ideal, it's a bit like social media now, you know, you show this little clip that your life's all perfect, but the reality is 95% of it, it's, a lot of it's based on a lie, you know, and that's how it was in, in show business. And, uh, and that shocked me initially, you know, I started to meet other celebrities and, and they were in all the newspapers, you know, the king of Saturday night television when I was on was Michael Barrymore, and he could do no wrong, this man, you know, and people were like, what's he like? And I knew him personally, and I was like... I couldn't say anything. It's a bit like the Weinstein scandal now, when someone's got so much power and they're a big star. For me, who's just got this job on Gladiators, I'm like, I can't lift the lid on their biggest star because I'll lose my job. So I was meeting lots of people that were on telly, celebrated superstars, Jimmy Savile, Savile Rolf Harris, like I say, Michael Barrow. There was loads of them. Um, and, they were, and the fame had corrupted them. So I thought, this is strange. We're celebrating these people, but they, they don't even tell you their real name. They're not really who they say they are. So it was a bit strange, and it started to, that, that started to confuse me a little bit. I was like, and, and also, of course, I started to realize that you know, most of it was based on a lie, and actually I was being rewarded to lie. So like, I'd have celebrity girlfriends, and then we'd just get up in the morning, make up a pack of lies, 
sell it to newspapers, uh, and they'd say, no, can you make it a bit more salacious, a bit more gory details, and we'll pay you a few more grand. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, how much, you know, so we'd make all this stuff up, and I was rewarded for life. So, you know, that really does corrupt a man's soul. When you're watching your dad work harder than anyone you've ever seen work, and he can't make 80 quid, and you can pick up the phone and tell a pack of lies, and, and there's a whole market for it, a whole media circus going on, and people are, you know, there's, they're, they're buying and consuming this stuff, and you're part of that, it really does something to you. You're, you're rewarded for lying. It's strange. So it was, uh, on the outside, I looked very successful, fit, healthy, strong, muscly, had everything, but in the inside... I was spiritually bankrupt, and I knew I was getting darker, actually. I knew that things weren't quite right. There was a real world out there where people really earned their money, and then there was show business, which wasn't what I thought it was. Um, and eventually, it, all good things come to an end. Gladiator ran well, well, longer, but how did, you, how did they tell you it was coming to an end? Uh, well, they didn't. Again, it's, they don't want to tell you because it wants to be sensational, and I just remember picking up. I was very classy. I bought a son. And I opened the sun and it said in there, glad it is you are daddy. Because it should be you are ready. It just said you are daddy. So I read it uh, in a newspaper and thought, well, I better ring the bank then because I don't know how I'm going to pay this mortgage if, these, uh, if I'm not getting these big checks coming in. And, and the other point I wanted to make there, Matt, that I didn't make was nobody taught me the, um, the paradox of pleasure, which just really means the more you get of something, the less it satisfies. You know, in a consumer culture, I just thought, well, if I could, I'd be content with contents. If I just get everything I want... I'll be happy. But actually, uh, in the end, I felt I was on a golden treadmill that I just couldn't get off of. And the more I went up that ladder, the more false things got, you know. So um, uh, instead of this, you know, this wealth and this material stuff liberating me, it actually trapped me. And actually, it started to become my identity, the muscles, the money. So when the show ended, it's like, who am I? You know, it was all based on this, and it's like a pack of cards that's just been pulled, you know. So I had an identity crisis, really. Uh, and you ended up trying other TV roles, so DIY SOS, was that the, was that the next move? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I thought, okay, I'll get a job, because like I say, I've done a bit, little bit of building work with my dad here and there, begrudgingly, unpaid, by the way, um, and so I just applied to DIY SOS and said, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, come on, if you was a gladiator, yeah, let's do this, and it, was, it, it weren't long before I did a few shows with them, and, and essentially it was, again, it was this, it was this show this ideal, but the real's very different. As, as Larry's walking around going, isn't it amazing, this transformation? You know, the owner of the house is in the back room shouting and screaming that we've just painted a wall that's freshly plastered. You know, someone's getting electrocuted and we've just bodged up their house. It was like, it was like, oh, no, I don't want to be part of this anymore. This is just entertainment. This is for people to just watch, but it's all, it's all nonsense, really. And so I thought, I need to get in the real world. Like my dad said, skills pay the bills, you know, dirt, dirty hands, clean money, these things. I thought, if I get a real job, by now, all my brothers had moved on, they were settling down with families, they had good jobs, these things, and I thought, that's what I need. And it was a bit embarrassing, really. Like I say, all I could do is turn up to a kid's party like Krusty the Clown, you know, and, and so hi, kids, <laughs> no skills, this was, this, this was who I was. So I thought, well, if I train and get a decent job, and uh, uh, that, that will make me happy, that's what I need to do, settle down, you know, and... Uh, I was confused a little bit, really, because, again, I was still looking sideways. When you believe that all this wealth and getting the things you want will make you happy, and then suddenly um, uh, they don't, I started to look at other people's lives, and I started seeing that a lot of people are satisfied with a mortgage. You know, if I get a mortgage and the holidays a year and these things and the right partner, then I'll be, I'll be happy. And so I know this sounds a bit deep, but I remember looking up the, uh, the, the name mortgage, you know, and it means death loan. <laughs> mortgage means death loan. And I thought, do I really want to get a bigger house and go on a mortgage march to the grave? For what? You know, so, so that when I die, someone else nabs it all, or I give it to my kids who haven't earned it. None of that made any, any sense to me. And I love what um, Denzel Washington says. He, he says, um, there's no luggage racks on a hearse. He says, you can't take nothing with you. He says, if you reduce life to a game of Monopoly, you'll be very, very disappointed, and you'll die kicking and screaming. That's not what life's about. He said, the Egyptians tried to do that, and the what happened? They got robbed. Uh, and so just listening to these uh, philosophical ideas, I just found really, really interesting. And um, so, like I say, I went on a real spiritual search because I thought it's pointless chasing money. I don't want a bigger death, death loan. <laughs> where, so, where did you search? Like, what everywhere see? except the Bible and except Jesus Christ. So, so, you know, we live in this plural, you know, this, this lots of different religions, you know, you can sort of pretty much have a bit of this one and choose a bit of that, that one. But 
That didn't make any sense to me. I thought, you can't really have a half-truth, because by definition, that's a lie. It's, there's either a God or there isn't. You can't just say, well, there might be one here and there might not be there. And what a gamble that is. Am I really going to start following some religion that can be a load of nonsense, embarrass myself, my kids, my family? I don't want to do that. You see it happening a lot. So I just thought, I'm going to examine the evidence. I'd heard people say to me, you know, to know God, you've got to take a step of faith. And I have no, you know, I'm not really a big risk taker. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to take a step of faith. Either this stuff's true or it isn't. You can't have lots of different religions. And they say, no, you've just got to tolerate it all. And again, I know it seems a bit deep, but I looked at the word tolerate. And the definition of tolerate means to bear something that is contrary to the truth and harmful. And so it's a bit like, okay, well, we can tolerate, but someone, some, there's no truth getting through now, is there? So, so I, just, I just really went on a mission. I was quite blessed because financially I was sort of secure. A lot of people are caught up in the tyranny and the busyness of life. I was actually able to say, actually, I'm going to now sit back and examine the evidence uh, uh, of all the different religions. And at this point, like I said, I trained as a, as a site manager. I wasn't happy. I'd reduced my life to doing a job I didn't really like five days a week, bossing people around on a building site. A lot of pressure on my shoulders. Um, and I just really lived for the weekend. The weekend to come, I'd just go up to the pub with the lads or have a few bottles of wine and really just try and escape. My bubbles really got rid of my troubles. <laughs> I'd just literally escape at the weekend. Monday had come, I'd do it all over again. And I could see those life choices. I would be a sum of them. And at some point, I'd started to smoke as well. That I'm heading for a, a, an iceberg. And then you met, you're living up in York. Um, you meet a guy called Julian Richer, who owns Richer Sounds, which is one of the music shops. In, they've, got, they've got one in Bromley, but he's, uh, he was in the news uh, a year or so ago. He's sort of a Christian businessman, and he's yeah. handed over quite a lot of the business to his um, employees as he's retired and taken a big lump sum himself to give to sort of Christian work. Like, you ended up meeting him. Just tell us about that story. Okay, so after like a two-year spiritual search, which pretty much sent me around the bend, because I looked everywhere, so I checked out atheism, I checked out Hawkins, Dawkins, I checked it all out, I checked out all the different religions, morally commendable, most of them, at best, at worst, causing wars, death, these things, and uh, they all point to a fella in the end, you know, the founding fathers, a lot of the religions, is some, you know, bloke who's not divine and stuff, and even, you know, I looked at self-sufficiency, you know, maybe, maybe it's all about yourself and self-improvement, I looked at a lot of that stuff, the power of now, I just literally looked, I went on so many courses and I found a lot of it like Ponzi schemes, you know, you, you're paying for the next book, but actually by the end of it, you're not spiritually liberated. You're, you're none of the wiser with a lot of this stuff. And actually, like you say, uh, it just shows, you know, if you don't know God or if you don't put your faith in God, you will put your faith in something else, whether it's politics, academia, whatever else. And I was still putting my faith in money because actually it was somebody that invited me to a fellowship meeting in the garden of a guy called Julian Richard, who's the biggest independent business owner in this country, and I knew that he had two helicopters and a couple of private jets, and, and I knew that Prince Charles paid him, I think, £10,000 an hour for business advice, and I heard that he had this, uh, these meetings in his garden, and it turns out he didn't live far from me, and uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to go around and have a chat with this bloke, maybe, you know, this guy's going to give me this, uh, this liberation, this freedom that, that I've always been looking for, but can't see this elusive freedom, and uh, I remember going into his garden, and uh, he does a buffet on a Friday and these things. And, uh, and some bloke was following me around, and he was trying to give me a sausage roll and a fork and these things. I said, look, mate, with respect, uh, I've only come here to meet this Julian fella. I'm not interested in the grub and the sausage roll. He said, pleased to meet you, I'm Julian. <laughs> 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 Which is really embarrassing. Um, uh, and it just shows how shallow I was. Um, but uh, I think what shocked me is he was the first person that I met, Matt, um, that were firstly, he was humble. So he was serving me. Um, I've met a lot of rich and a lot of famous people, and usually you know it. You know, if they've got a title, they'll tell you. Or you can tell by their watch or the clothing they're wearing or the car or the big entrance. You know, whatever it is, you can see it. They make sure you, that you know it. And, but this guy was humble. He was serving me. Uh, uh, and he made time to talk to me. And I thought that was a bit strange. And um, I didn't know at this point that he was Christian. And um, I got chatting to him over a couple of weeks, and he said to me, um, Warren, you know, he said, uh, you can keep trying to pursue this happiness and that you'll never find it. If you want true joy, there's something that you need to do. And I was like, well, what's that? I was intrigued, you know, thought, where's he going to send me with this? And he said, um, if I give you two bits of advice, would you take them? And I said, uh, well, yeah, yeah, you're like King Julian, you're the, 
you're a man, of course I will. Yeah. He said, do you respect me in business? I said, yeah, yeah, of course I do. He said, I'm going to give you two bits of advice that will change your life. He said, okay, go for it. He said, number one, go on an alpha course. Now, I didn't know what an alpha course was, but I've been on lots of courses. And what I found is a lot of these courses say, you give me a check, you pay this money and spend a week sat on a mountain in Tibet or something, I don't know. Uh, and then and you end up none of the wiser, and we end up a bit richer. But uh, so, so straight away, I thought to myself, another course? Why would he be trying to get me on a course? And the sort of wealth he's got, I thought, why would he be trying to recruit me for a course? And that's how cynical I was as well. And then the second bit of advice he gave me floored me. He just said, uh, and, then, and then get baptized <laughs> and come back to me. And I was like, get baptized? And I was like, oh. Oh no, he's a Bible basher. <laughs> I just thought, how can this bloke be God squad? I don't understand. Why? Surely he don't believe this nonsense. You know, I've been into churches and vicar, one vicar said to me, I said, what do you do in here? He said, hatch, match, dispatch. I said, what's that? He said, births, weddings and funerals. I was like, oh, like a business. He went, yes, exactly like a business. I said, oh, yeah, and I just thought that Christianity was a crutch for cribbles. So now here's a guy in front of me <laughs> telling me to get baptised. So I went back to my wife who's always identified as a Christian, and when I was on my spiritual search, she's always thought I'm going around the bend when I'm meditating in the garden and stuff. But when I got back, I said, that Julian's one of your mum. She's like, what? I said, he's, he's a Bible basher. He's one of these uh, religious Christians, whatever it is. And she said, um, oh, well, that doesn't surprise me if he's a nice person. Is it? And I was like, right. I said, and he's told us to go on an alpha course. And she said, well, maybe we should go on an alpha course, especially if you told him you're going to go on an alpha course. So we went on this Alpha course together, me and my wife, and uh, that was the first place in my 44 years of life that somebody actually explained to me the gospel. It became apparent that nobody had ever explained the gospel. And, um, and, and I was floored by it, actually. I was floored by the outlandish, outrageous claims that these vicars were making as I was asking these questions, and they were telling me that, I, that you know, I... In a strange way, I'd always believe that if God created me, if there is a God, you know, I want my place in space, but I'll wait till I'm a bit older, you know, and when I need an insurance policy, then I'll go to church. But so, so here I was, and I was a bit like, I was a bit like, right, okay, okay, so here's an alpha course, I can ask the big, big questions, and they're telling me that I'm disconnected from God. I've always thought, well, if he created me and he loves me, I must be, you know, when I get there and he judges me, he'll say, okay, well, and you've done more good than bad, so yeah, okay, you can go through the pearly gates. Um, uh, but here they're saying to me, no, actually, God is love. God is unconditional love. We're talking about the reality of a rela relationship with the living God of the Bible, of the universe who created everything. He created you. He wants to be in a relationship with you, and you've gone your own way. And that's all that sin is. You've just said, I'm going that way. And when Jesus turned up a couple of thousand years ago, Warren, and he said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent just means turn this way. You can chase all that. I'm unconditional love. It's not a religion. I'm not forcing myself on you, I give you uh, uh, for the freedom to choose. That's how much of a gentleman, gentleman I am. So it's up to you. Do what you want. So when they said that, I was like, why has no one ever told me that? It's very simple stuff. But again, I think what really done, done my head in with a hard heart and cynical in a world of show business, it's glitters and glamour and red carpets, to suddenly be told you can be in a relationship with God. You know, I'm like, okay, what's this going to cost me? And then when they said to me... Um, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, which in the, in the Old Testament, only kings, priests, and prophets got filled with. But actually, you're living in the golden age of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. Um, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, uh, that can happen to you if you submit to Jesus and invite him into your life. All your sins can be forgiven, past, present, and future. And also, guess what else? You'll live forever. So, you know, we all die. Everyone's moving up the queue. He said, but that's not God's plan for us, actually. He's created us for a purpose, and actually... Jesus conquered death on the cross, and you're not meant to die. And so you can actually have eternity with God. Not only eternity with God, you can have abundant life now. To me, all this was just so... I couldn't wrap my head around it. I'm like, and how much is this going to cost me? You know, and they're like, nothing at the point of receiving it. But once you've received this, it will cost you everything because your whole life will change. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instead of being in a life of acquisition, you seeing what you can get, you're born to be a blessing. The Holy Spirit will work through you and you'll be working in your passions and your giftings, and actually you'll be changing your, the world. You'll, be, you'll find your part in history, a divine purpose, not pursuing happiness, a divine purpose that you were created for. I was like, this is just incredible. And I'll tell you where the real crux of this was. I remember sitting down, and I tried proving them wrong on this course, all the way through it. It's like a Christianity Explored course, Alpha. 
So I tried proving them wrong. I had no idea of the empirical evidence of Jesus Christ. When I was going to the British Museum and I was seeing the Codex Sinaiticus, the first Bible ever written, I was seeing John's Gospel, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was recognizing the real gladiator story in Roman times. Jesus turned up in the, in the middle of it and he stopped the gladiator games and the Roman Empire that killed him all became Christians within 300 years. And you can prove all this stuff. It was like incredible. So once I realized this guy, Jesus, I'm living my, my time to him, 2020 years since he was a born, most important event in human history. Here I am sitting here and Ben says to me, the curate, he says, the biggest block between you and God, Warren, is you. You just can't come to the end of yourself. You cannot submit to something that's not your idea. And I said to him, you know, you said that Christianity is not a religion. It means Christ in you. So you don't really meet Jesus in person. He comes with his Holy Spirit. That's why he went. He said, I'm going to give you my power so you can do what I did and more. That's what I've created you for. And he said, yeah. And I'm born to be a blessing. He said, yeah. I said, well, my wife's a Christian. And he said, yeah. I said, there's absolutely no evidence of this supernatural power in her. <laughs> and how did she take that? <laughs> she was professing to be a Christian yeah, at the so time, but she, yeah, she yeah. probably was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure and, she probably and, was a Christian at that moment. Yeah, yeah. And this was really, you know, he, he, had, he, he was bold enough to step across the room there because he then went, he looked at me, steam come out my wife's ears, you know, everyone else in the room was like, <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and I thought he was going to say, uh, he said, Warren, I said, yeah, I thought he was going to say, get out, you know. And, and I said, yeah, and he said, um, you're right. And I was like, right. And I thought, wow, I've got a vicar on my side and a domestic, this is incredible. Um, <laughs> talk about the moral high ground. Um, and so, and so, and then he said, though, what are you going to do about it? And isn't that strange? You know, I'd had all this analysis paralysis, you know, all this indecision, but decision, indecision is a decision not to make a commitment. But here I was now in this corner where he's like, so what are you going to do about it? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the son of God? You've examined the evidence. Do you believe that in your heart? Because if you do, you're one prayer away from crossing over from death to life. You know, you might have thought you had it all on the telly, but you was living life in 2D. You wasn't, you're not even being born spiritually yet. You wait to see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And I was like, right. He said, so should we say a prayer? And I'd gone there to prove him wrong. You know, I was like, uh, yeah, okay then. And so I stood up and it was there where I said this prayer. And uh, I've got to be honest, I've read so many of these um, uh, New Age teachings that well, after I said the prayer, very simple prayer, sorry for going my own way for my sins. I do believe you're the son of God, Jesus. Come into my life. Make me the person you created me to be. Um, and it was as simple as that, and I opened my eyes, and I really expected, this is going to sound really daft, but I really expected to be sort of floating a little bit. <laughs> you know, a bit, of a, a bit of a glow, you know, or just, just, just something, you know. But I opened my eyes, and I just felt exactly the same. And I was like, well, where's this supernatural power? I think I've been watching too much Bruce Almighty, you know what I mean? Something like that. High or silver, cars, and all the cars move yeah, out of yeah. your way. That's what I was hoping, but that didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, but that was uh, five years ago, and uh, simply, I am not the person today that I was five years ago. Everything has changed. And interestingly, my wife, who's always professed to be a Christian, saw such a change in me within two weeks that, that we went back to this alpha call. She said, well, this prayer that you said with Warren, I need to say it. Because she realized she's no more a Christian than me standing in the, in the garage and saying, making me a mechanic, you know. So she said this prayer. Uh, where she invited God into her life and um, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and her life also was transformed. The reality hit. So we've been seeing all the way through, you know, the perfect body didn't prove to be enough in your life. But has Jesus proved to be enough? Uh, well, everything's, everything's changed. I mean, I'm on an exciting adventure now, Matt, as you would know. Um, and, and so I... I there's a few analogies I like to use to try and make it simple. One of them is I came out of the rat race, without a doubt, I came out of the rat race into God's grace. And what I mean by that is although I appeared to have everything, I was still competing, still striving, still envious, still proving myself, scared to death that I was going to be just like somebody else. That all changed. When I realized my identity is in God, and God's created me to be a disciple of Jesus. That's incredible. You're part of God. It's so liberating. There's so much freedom that comes from that. It's like, I don't strive at all. You know, I was in the rat race, and I was king rat. I was doing well in that race. But actually, it's a complete load of nonsense. Like Denzel Washington says, you know, all, this, all this stuff's going away. It's all falling away. All empires fail. You can buy as much as you want, but all empires crumble. The kingdom of God will remain, and that's the purpose of our life. So, Sometimes people say to me, oh, yeah, you know, this religion, as long as it makes you happy. I say, firstly, it's not a religion. 
it's the reality of knowing God, of a relationship with God. But secondly, I'm not buying into that consumer culture nonsense. You know, the pursuit of happiness, as long as it makes me happy. I don't do any of this because it makes me happy. I do it because I've moved into a divine purpose. I have a joy and a peace in my life that I've never experienced before, which is just incredible, you know. And uh, every day is an exciting adventure. I have to pinch myself. You know, I wake up. It's not all highs, you know, but pursuing the Holy Spirit is a very exciting thing. And actually, we're born in a very exciting time, but also in a great, great nation that's based on uh, Christian foundations, you know, and it's Great Britain for a reason. So I'm seeing lots of revival. I'm seeing lots of exciting things happen. And I was just saying earlier on to Matthew, a lad out here, I was saying, as I switch on the news and I see, you know, viruses, economies crashing, Trump being impeached, locusts here, floods here, and all this, I'm like, man, how do people get out of bed in the morning? You know, I live a life now of love, not fear. And I think, I'd be scared to death if I didn't know where I'm going. If I didn't know the purpose of my life, I would be scared to death switching on that television. So it's very liberating for me. And what, what would you say, what would be your advice as we close to somebody who wants to look into the Christian faith for themselves? Like, well, how would you kind of encourage them? Very, very simple, really. Uh, examine the evidence of the person of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing that you can do in your life. It's the difference between um, life and death. And just to clarify that, um, you know, when I was on Gladiators, I wouldn't get out of bed for less than £2,000 an hour. I just wouldn't. So I'm not here to recruit anybody. I'm not here to push a religion on anybody. And it makes no odds to me. And actually, nobody's paying me to be here. I've come here to share the gospel because my life was transformed by it. And that's a divine privilege. And I know this will have ramifications into eternity. So, uh, so like I say, when, when people are telling you stuff like this, I, just, I remember being in that place of not believing, so cynical, so hard-hearted. Um, so, so, yeah, just to finish on that, maybe something like a Christianity Explored course, just examine the evidence for yourself. That's all I say. No leap of faith required. Look into this. It will be the best and most important thing that you can do with this life. Well, on that, let's say um, thanks to Warren. Get him to go no, grab a seat. Good.